Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Are you ready to discover some niche business ideas that actually work? Well, it's time for a motivational kick to jumpstart your next big idea. Here's your host, Spencer Haas. Hey, everybody. This is Perrin for Niche Site Project 3, and this is coaching call number eight with Colleen Kinsey. Colleen, uh, how's it going? going really well. I have a big announcement. I have finished all my articles. Finally, all work and no play for coin, but I got yeah. them all done. Crushing. I'm really happy about that. And I think you still have seven coming in from a writer. Um, I do. But all of yours are pretty much finished and you can start focusing on marketing, right? Right. And then another thing that we worked on this week was getting my site close to the reveal. So that is coming up too. Stay yeah. tuned. And we're super excited about that. And uh, the call today is going to be a little bit different. So most of our calls up until now have been me kind of preaching at Colleen. Today, we worked on it more collaboratively. And I think we're probably going to try to do this sort of thing from here on out. But instead of me writing most of the stuff, what we did instead was work through some of the actual stuff Colleen was doing. We did a bunch of planning, and then we are doing some sort of lessons learned from Colleen, plus some Q&A for me, and then we've got some examples queued up that we also planned. And then I'm also going to teach a little bit at the end based on what questions Colleen has. But the overall format is going to be Colleen sort of showing you what she has learned that I haven't been talking about or that's related to what we've been talking about. And then we're going to show you some actual examples. And hopefully it'll be a little bit more hands-on and a little bit more collaborative uh, than it has been. So we've got the update out of the way. A quick recap maybe of what we talked about last week. So Colleen's been mostly working on content. But the last couple of coaching calls have been about guest posting. Um, so guest posting is not super easy, and the prospecting can be a little bit difficult. But we talked about how to go about it, how to approach sites, how to find sites, and why it's important. Colleen has had a chance to do a little bit of work already, and she's had some successes, but she's also hit a few snags. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to see what Colleen has to teach you, and then I'm going to jump in and see what I can teach you and Colleen based on what we're going to talk about. So overall, it should be pretty fun. So I guess we can probably get started, right? Yeah. yeah. I know we, we've been sort of playing with the structure of this call, Colleen, so we can switch back and forth between these lessons and examples if you have them, or we can do all the examples at the end, whatever you think works best uh, sort of on the fly, but... We've got some good examples and some good stuff to talk about, so we can play it by ear. All right. Let's do it. Okay. So I definitely had some lessons learned these past couple of days. After I finished all my content, I started working on guest posting, and I definitely hit some snags and kind of found myself running in circles a little bit. So one of the things that I learned was to have a plan. I really like to just jump in head first to things and I kind of learned my lesson on this because I needed to apply organization. So one of the things I wanted to show you was this spreadsheet that I made and I'll kind of be going back and forth through it throughout my call. But so first I just made a Google spreadsheet doc and last week we talked a little bit about what to search for for guest posts mm -hmm. and for my example, I'm just going to use coffee because that's been what is fueling me this past week. Mm -hmm. So it's been on my mind. It's not my site, but it'll just be our example for today. Sure. Okay. So one thing I did is I wanted to take a list of all the keywords that I was going to search because I found myself going back and forth, thinking of an idea, getting onto that idea and running with that, but forgetting the first idea. So part of that is kind of my personality. Maybe other people people are a little bit more organized than me, but I found this structure to be very helpful. So, And you can see all of the queries that we talked about here. And one of the things that we also found this week was going for more general queries to find guest posts instead of 
more specific queries. And in particular, we started removing operators like in URL and in title because the thing with guest posts is sometimes the guest post just, I mean, the words guest post won't be included in the URL or the title. So it'll be maybe in an introduction or in a footer or something. So we made that move too, and you can see that reflected in these queries. Yeah, I definitely found that the in URL, while it was helpful to find exact matches, sometimes it was a little bit too restrictive. Yep. Okay, so starting out with a nice little spreadsheet. So and, and oh, yep, go ahead. Quick, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but the actual spreadsheet you're using for guest posting, maybe you can just fill in some of the columns that you're using, like to to keep track of the actual opportunities you're finding. So we've got here we go right there. Yeah. So this is and. Stop me if this is something that you were going to talk about later, but I think it fits nicely under this idea of organization. So what is all this stuff? What are you looking at, and why did you pick these columns? Okay, so first off, we started, you know, very general, just the contact name, email, and website, but I found that I needed more information to relate back to. So the first column, the URL, I would put the guest post blog that I found. And then in column B, I would put just the exact blog. So for example, one of them I have is oops, not that, eat, eat naked now. So it would just be eat naked now.com. And so then I would, if I had found a contact name to do the guest post, I would put their last name and their first name here and then their email address. Yep. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the email address because we went back and forth on this too. Um, so we'll probably talk about that later. We're at that. Okay, We're at, that's fine. We'll talk about finding contact information. So, but yeah, Perfect. good point. Yeah, and then I would put the DA of the blog because we were kind of looking for around thirty or higher, right? Mm -hmm. And then after looking at their site, I would kind of generate a personalized sentence that I would say to them. So. Maybe something about their site, maybe something about an article that the editor had written or the person that I'm contacting had written. And then I would give my pitch ideas, which I will talk a little bit about later. And I also wanted to put a column for contact forms because that was something I ran into if whether to do contact forms on websites or not or just going for their exact email address. Sure. So we talked about this a little bit when we were working through this this week, but what's the benefit of recording all of this stuff now? So I guess I'll let you say that, but before I let you chime in, I guess I can say that one of the benefits of recording all this stuff now and on a spreadsheet is that with most of the outreach tools you can use, aside from some of the ones where you have to input stuff individually, you can upload a spreadsheet using columns as fields. So this is the case in stuff like BuzzStream. And I think some of the other ones like Ninja Outreach, um, BuzzStream was only like $19 a month. So if we do want to go that route and spend $19 to do one round of outreach, we'll have the spreadsheet ready and we'll have the fields ready to use. But yeah. other than that, why are we recording all of this stuff right now? Well, personally, for me, I think it's easier to stay focused on one thing, collecting all the information, and then when I switch gears to actually contacting them, then I can just run through it. Yep, totally. So if we're thinking about sending an email and we're using something like Yesware, we might write an email that says, you know, that has like a short introduction and then we could put in a field for a personalized sentence and then we might write another sentence and then we could put in a field for pitch idea one, pitch idea two, pitch idea three. So we don't have to rewrite that stuff every time. We don't have to go back and look at every single blog. We've already got it in the spreadsheet and by just filling in those fields in something like Yesware or BuzzStream, it makes it about a million times faster because we've already looked at them and we've recorded the data. So overall, I think it's really important for people to see how exactly we are organizing it. It's obviously not the only way, but we think we've done a pretty good darn job of being efficient about it and being organized. Yes, absolutely. And I like color coding. So oh, yeah. blue is complete or red is delete. Totally. But then I still have it marked down. Yep. All right. So another thing that I found is not every site is going to be great for guest posting. So at the beginning, when I was starting this strategy, 
I was trying to find everything under the sun. So, for example, I would search for coffee guest post by. Mm-hmm. And I would look for everything that would equivalent to that and then try to tailor my pitches to that website. And Perrin kind of talked me down from that and told me, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't exactly relevant to what you're writing about. So an example that I found is this Star Wars website. So, yes, it says coffee with, but is it actually about coffee? Right. No, it's about Star Wars. So maybe not the best for my site and probably a move on. Sure, so yeah, but I think there's a little gray area here, and I think it's a really important thing to cover. So you certainly don't want to pitch a coffee guest post on a Star Wars blog that happens to have coffee in the name. That's way too far off. However, if there is some overlap, so maybe – There is a yoga blog that you find that has published more than a couple posts on coffee because that blogger happens to like coffee. It certainly is feasible to pitch that yoga blog a really great idea about coffee and yoga. So like maybe health benefits of coffee before you do a yoga routine in the morning. That would be a really reasonable guest pitch. So you might find those sorts of opportunities and you just have to make a call. You don't want to pitch the Star Wars blog on your coffee recipe because it's just not going to work and it's not worth your time. But there might be a pattern where a site doesn't look look like it's on your exact topic, but they like to publish stuff on your topic. And if you can find a little bit of overlap, it might be worth pitching. And that's also why it pays to record all the stuff in a spreadsheet while you're doing your research because you can make a little note and you can write a pitch as you're looking at the site instead of going back. So I totally agree. And we had to make a move away from some of the stuff that Colleen was finding, but there is some gray area and there might be some hidden opportunities. uh, And the lesson really is just, you have to look at the sites. Yeah. And I think another thing is in that gray area, knowing how gray to get to, like how long are you really going to search to see if that site can be relevant for your Mm -hmm. site? That's another issue that I ran into. Yep. was putting a deadline on how long to look at one site. For sure. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too. Yeah. Okay. So, and that kind of leads into how I want the article I'm pitching to be relevant to my site and topic. Mm-hmm. And this is, I wanted to create catchy headlines. Originally I was doing. Well, let's go back of, one second to the articles or the, you want the articles you're pitching to be relevant to your site and your topics. Why is that? So that you can link it back to your site. Right. And so we came, we, we ran into a few of the problems because one of the things we did this first round of guest posting was brainstorm a bunch of pitches. And that turned out to be kind of a bad idea, right? Um, right. <laughs> because the snag we hit was we were brainstorming great pitches for the sites we were finding, stuff that would fit really well with their audience, but they weren't articles that we could feasibly use to link back to our site. Right. So if we're using coffee as an example, like maybe we find a gadget blog. It's like the smarter image blog or something. And we're writing about like this crazy new espresso machine, whatever it happens to be. But we don't have any articles about espresso or coffee technology on our blog. It'd be very hard to link back from that article naturally to something on our site. And so that's similar to the problem that we are running into is that we didn't have enough relevance between the content that was actually on our site and the pitches that we were going to be making to the other site. So we caught it pretty early, and it could have been really awkward talking to the webmasters and asking them to link to some of these more or less irrelevant articles. But after making the change, it was pretty easy because all it was – or or the solution was just coming up with new and different pitches, right? They were just as good for their audience, just as good of a fit for their site, but they were also articles that we could feasibly link back to or easily and naturally link back to stuff that we were publishing on our blog. Right. And I'm just going to skip ahead here because this goes 
along great with one of my tips and tricks that I found is creating basically categories of headlines to pitch. So I would find different blogs or websites and I would create specific headlines to go with that type of blog. So like, for example, if it was a news blog, I would try to find, I would try to think of a headline that was trendy or up and coming or it was, or if it was knowledge based, culture, technology, and relate it to those, those headlines to those sites. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think it's really good too. And and one of the reasons we did that was basically for just pure efficiency, right? So we found that if we're making and brainstorming brand new pitches for every single site, it would just eat up too much time. So instead, we had three or four or five pitches for each category that we could use for that type of blog, right? So if it's a coffee and health blog or if it's a coffee post on a health site and that's the sort of thing we were finding we might come up with three or four ideas that relate to coffee and health that we could pitch all of the health sites that sort of thing yep exactly and then i would just record all of the ones that i had thought of on the spreadsheet so then i could easily just copy and paste them into my pitches yep awesome and it ended up saving us a lot of time and it let us be a little bit more dedicated to these pitches idea or come up with better pitch ideas because for each category we could just brainstorm four or five really good ones and then we kind of had them locked and loaded ready to go right but right now you see an awesome pitch but in reality before we had talked it was just health benefits of coffee so one thing that Perrin noticed on my site and also some of my on my pitches was that they weren't catchy enough and a tool that Perrin mentioned to me was CoSchedule. Hold on one second, Colleen. So let's talk okay. about the value of these catchy headlines because it's good sure. for guest posts, and it's, but it's also very important for your site. So we were pretty much in content production mode for like the last month, right? Uh, we yes. were just trying to get articles up. And what uh, we done is just have the title as the exact keyword because – Really, we didn't care about much of anything else. We just wanted to get the site about content. full of good content. The problem is, if it's just one boring keyword in your title, you won't get many people clicking on it in the actual search results. And people clicking on your link in the search results is one of the indicators to Google that your site is uh, worth ranking, right? There are a bunch, but that's one of them. So you want highly clickable, catchy headlines that grab people's attention in the search results and get them to click. So it's important for your sites. It's an, it's important for SEO. It's also important for guest posting because what you're going to be doing is sending people an email saying like, hey, do you want these articles on your site? And obviously, if you're pitching really amazing ideas, people are going to be more likely to say yes. So if you're pitching something generic like why coffee is good, no one's going to want to accept that guest post. They don't know what it's about. It seems boring, etc. If you pitch them a really specific guest post with a great headline that would work for their audience, they're much more likely to say yes. So we started using a tool, and I may have shared this on Niche Pursuits, I'm not sure, uh, or even in one of the previous coaching calls, but we'd like to show it to you in action. So walk us through. Yeah, yeah and I didn't know about it before, so it could be new for other people. And Karen and I kind of had a competition on who could get the highest scoring headline, which we tied. So I wonder if anyone can get higher than we can. But so for example, what are the amazing health benefits of coffee? So probably before that I had. So what, what is this tool generally, first of all? So it analyzes your headline. So it looks at the different types of words that are in your headline. I believe some of them are like emotional words, power words, uncommon words that aren't generally used to catch your audience's attention. Yep. And just to ta or add on to that, CoSchedule performed a bunch of research, basically, and they analyzed which headlines get the most clicks. And then they started breaking that data down. So like the number of certain types of words, so the number of common words, like a and the, the number of power words, the number of heavily emotional words, the number of words in the headline total. And you can see all of this stuff on the site. This is a free tool, by the way. But yeah. when you plop in a headline into, into CoSchedule, it'll give you a score and it'll show you information for all of those types of things. Yep. 
And so here it kind of gives you a list of the common words. I had an, a hard time finding power words. and But one thing that's nice is that they do have PDFs of words that are powerful or emotional that you can look at to plug and play into your headline for what works. And also another thing is you get extra points if it's a question or how to or top 10, those types of headlines. So what was this headline? This just... was, well, it's, it's a question. That's and, and what was the exact headline that you typed in there? What are the amazing health Oh, I see. Yeah. Coffee. Okay. And yeah. the score was 74. Yeah. So yep. pretty much anything in the green is okay. It's not worth spending too much time on these. This is not an exact science. And I've written plenty of headlines that generate lots of clicks that have bad scores in this. But it's a good test, and if you're only going to be, you know, brainstorming three or four headlines for each category of site you're sending out to, it's worth spending a little bit more time on them. And this is one of the ways that we're trying to increase our conversions for our guest post pitches. Yes, and plus I think it forced me to be a little bit more creative. Yeah, and so... This might be a good time to share one of your guest posting successes. You haven't sent out a ton of emails, right? You've sent out maybe a couple dozen or how many? Uh, yeah, I sent out about 20. You sent out 20 about 20 emails. Right. About 20 yep. emails. And already our conversion rate is about 5%. You've gotten one good response and they, imp they specifically said they liked one of your headlines, right? Yes. But if there was a caveat. They said that they don't usually or they hardly ever accept guest posts. But they picked one of my headlines that they thought would be relevant to their users. Yeah, and they said it was. It, they said it looked good, sounded good, and I think it, we don't know if they're saying that they don't accept it or they don't normally accept guest posts, but ours sounds awesome, or they don't normally accept guest posts, but we can try anyway. <laughs> like we don't know, <laughs> yeah. but stay tuned. Um, but it. It seems like they're asking us to write that article, asking you to write that article. Um, so, so far, the conversion rate is about 5%. We've only sent 20 emails, which is um, a really good conversion rate when you're doing outreach. So, hopefully, they will accept it and we can get even a couple more. So, what's what's your next lesson for us? My next lesson. Talked about that. And my next is method for finding what I think are good sites to guest post on. So... One of the ways that Perrin taught me, um, we talked about plugging in the keywords and guest post by or what have you. And so then just looking through at the DAs and taking a look and seeing what looks relevant. Mm -hmm. And so here are those two that I just showed you. And I already have this one up. And one of the really easy things is if it's a guest post and then they have a different person. So an editor that's posting the article for the guest poster. Mm -hmm. So that makes it a lot easier to find someone to contact. So when I find those, I'm very excited and put them in my sheet ASAP. Yep, I feel like is, those are easier targets. Right. This is one of the things we talked about uh, briefly in some of our other coaching calls, but we haven't shown it to you yet. And it's it's probably one of the easiest ways to find the best person to contact. So if you find a guest post that was posted by an editor, that's probably one of the best people you can possibly contact because you know they have control over what is posted on the site. You have their name, and you can reference some of the guest posts that they've already posted, and you know what they kind of like to post too. Um, so for this one, you could – Say like, hey, Margaret, I saw you did this guest post by Craig. Uh, I really loved it. I thought I could add to the conversation. What do you think about these ideas? And that person who's already been publishing guest posts on similar topics probably has a really high chance of saying yes. Right. Or one thing that I've been doing is looking at articles that that editor has written and then directly complimenting on one of their articles and relating it to my pitches. Which is super, super good idea. Um, I've even complimented people on their like pets and stuff before. But if you find some of that stuff, you would just put it maybe in your personalized sentence in your uh, spreadsheet. Right. This guy right here. Yep. So you would say, hey, Margaret, love the article you wrote on blah, 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 or whatever it is. So that's um, uh, and I, maybe let's talk about a few of the other methods um, sure. for finding good guest posts. We were originally trying to find super high DA stuff, but we kind of 
pivoted to finding more opportunities, even though we have a rather high cutoff point of around DA30. We also know that we're a new site and we want to get as many links as we can, however we can. Of course, the ones with um, the, the sites with really high DA are going to move the needle most. But we want to just start the links coming in, so we're also looking at some lower DA stuff. Also, we're currently looking for those higher quality leads using the guest post buy to find active sites that are publishing guest posts that may not have a right for us page, may not be advertising guest posts, but I think we might also look for some right for us pages if this round of guest posting doesn't yield many results. Um, so we have a certain methodology, but we're also kind of tweaking it as we go. Right, exactly. It's not set in stone. Figuring it out on our way. Well, Perrin, you probably already know the way, but I'm figuring it out on my way. <laughs> well, I do. I mean, the thing about building links is that it's not at all paint by number, and uh, you fail a lot. That's that's why, and we say this and giggle about it privately, um, link building is what separates the women from the boys, right? This is the this is the hard part. It's different in every market. It's different for every site. It's different for every piece of content you're trying to build links to. Um, so it is not easy. And one of the things that makes it hard is that it's it's fluid, and you have to adapt, and you have to be prepared to fail. It's very possible that the, that this round of guest posting might yield one link or two links, right? But that's just kind of how it goes. So I don't necessarily know the way. I know the tactics, but for most guest posting campaigns and most outreach most outreach campaigns, you just have to start throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Do you feel like different strategies work for different topics or different genres of blogs? Yeah, big time. So for example, in the internet marketing space, having people on your podcast is like a really great way to to build links because you can have them on yours and then they have you on theirs. Everybody has a podcast and people love doing podcasts and it's just one of the conventions in this industry. For other stuff like, say, recipes, in the recipe niche, infographics do extraordinarily well because that's just the thing that people like in that market, you know? In something like technology or education, one of the things that does really well is like online tools. So tools that where you can take a quiz and it tells you your major and then all the schools that offer it or whatever it happens to be, those tend to do well in that market. So yeah, and like it's not obvious in every market. And sometimes there's no one thing that works extraordinarily well in every market. And that's one of the reasons why most of the time for a new site, you just kind of have to end up throwing stuff at the wall. So all right. So one of my biggest struggles has been finding contact information. There's not always guest posts that have the editor's name or not always exact contact information or emails. And that's kind of been where I've hit the wall, I think. So throwing this one back at you, Perrin. Yeah. Okay. So this is the biggest hurdle for most outreach that you are going to do. It's certainly... The thing that takes the most time. So it's easy to find sites that you want links on. Oftentimes it's difficult to find actual people to contact, right? So I wanted to briefly go over some of the, not even, not necessarily tricks or tips, but just best practices, I suppose, for finding contact information, how I like to do it. And then I think we're also going to talk about efficiency a little bit. So I think we can go ahead and go to the first slide here. One more. All right, so where do you look when you are trying to find people to contact? Basically, you want to look anywhere on the site that's going to have information about the actual people. So an about page is a good place to look. Contact page is a good place to look. A team page is a good place to look. Um, I also like to look at staff and editors pages. The trick here is to find people who are likely to email you back. So one of the mistakes I think a lot of people make are to find the owner of every single site. That sometimes won't yield the best results because if you find a big site that's getting a lot of traffic uh, or making a lot of money, the owner probably has better stuff to do than go through guest post pitches. There's probably somebody else doing that. 
And that kind of comes back to how, how you pitch big sites versus small sites. But when you're looking at contact information or when you're trying to find contact information, if you can't find it explicitly on one of these pages, usually you want to find people. But it's hit or miss and the you know, there's no golden rule or there's no sort easy way to find this stuff. Lots of times you're just not gonna find an email. So if I think when we were when we sat down and we looked at some together and based on what you've already done and based on what I usually see in my research, we figure about 40% of the sites that we look at will we'll be able to find an email for. So the majority won't have an email mostly because people hate getting spammed. Right. And that's okay. The rule of thumb is just to find whatever contact information you can. So if you can't find people to contact, um, you can use contact pages and that sort of thing. But, to find people, usually I look at these pages in this order. So the about page, contact page, team page, staff page, editor page. Sometimes there will also be an email button next to social media buttons in a footer or in a sidebar. Um, but you mostly just have to poke around. Also, sometimes if you find those instances where there's somebody else posting a guest post, you can click on that person's name and it will have all of their posts plus a bio. And that bio sometimes includes an email or a Twitter page or something. So the thing that I didn't mention here, which is also possible, just just not optimal, is to go to people's social media pages. So if there's no email, you can almost always find their Twitter or their Facebook. It's not the best way to contact people, but it's another way. Yeah, and one way that I found is I found that a lot of writers also have personal blogs or personal websites promoting themselves. And in those cases, I feel like they're more willing to be contacted. So I've put their email down on their personal site for the site that I'm trying to guest post on, which may be taboo. I don't know. Uh, maybe taboo, but it's totally fine. You know, we'll see if it works. Right. Yeah. And um, I actually, for, for my best link, I got that email in a similar way. I've found out who, the head honcho was at that place and I went to their personal site and I found their email there. And when I e emailed them, they're like, Hey, this is a really good pitch. And yes, we want it. But how the hell did you find my email? Right. And sometimes you just have to go after it. But I found that most people, if they even notice, and most of them don't yep, usually ap appreciate the tenacity. So it's fine. The creepy versus persistent. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> sometimes they're the same thing. So I, next slide. Okay. When you start finding people, sometimes you'll find more than one. Sometimes you won't find any, but sometimes you'll find more than one. I like to prioritize them this way. And prioritizing emails really is important because if you don't prioritize emails, you have a bigger chance of failure and or having to go back to a site and find another email and email another person. So... The way I like to prioritize it is first, I look for owners, mostly for small blogs. If it's a huge blog, like I said, uh, I don't look for the owner. But if it's a small or medium blog, I do look for the person who has created it. If I can't find that person or if it's a bigger site, I will look for an editor who publishes guest posts. So very similar to the example we were looking at earlier, I'll find a guest post and I'll find the editor who actually published it on the site. Um, that's one of the best possible contacts you can have. If you can't find those, I'll find any editor at all. That might be an associate editor. It might be the editor-in-chief. It might be an assistant editor. For some reason, I find that assistant and associate employees work really well. I think because they don't get as many emails. Everybody's emailing the main person, and they are just deleting them. Assistant editors or junior editors tend to be pretty good at responding and flattered when you email them. Um, so any editor at all, but junior editors are really good. If you can't find editors, I like to email marketing people. These aren't the best. I don't think a lot of people like talking to marketing people. The reason they're better than like webmasters in general emails is because they're always looking to grow the the site in some way. And they understand most of the time because they're out there pushing their own content that free content helps the site grow. So talking to marketing people may not be the most direct way to get a guest post published, but they can almost always 
do a warm introduction to the person who does publish that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes it's the same person. You never know. If you can't find any of those people's, a webmaster email is okay or a general email. So like info at whatever the domain is dot com or admin at whatever the domain is dot com. They're not the best, uh, but they can't work. And then if you can't find any email at all, just send them a message message through their contact form. It's totally fine. It's not optimal. People uh, have a tendency to delete those. But if you can't find any emails, get your message out there any way you can. Do you have any questions about that, Colleen? Just a comment. I think during my first round of strategizing, I was trying to just focus on getting personal email contacts and not the generic ones. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard and it takes a lot of time. So I think that you have to prioritize and also make sure that you're working efficiently because I kind of got stuck into that. Yep. So take whatever email you can. It doesn't have to be a personal email. Uh, Get your message to them in whatever way possible. And in some cases, you know, even reach out on social media if it's a contact you really want to make. All right. So the next thing is automation. There are very few good contact finding tools out there. Buzzstream has one. There are some other tools out there. I think Ninja Outreach has one. But they're all really pretty bad. It's really one of my pet peeves. And the first person who can make a contact finding tool that works, I think, is going to be rich. Because it's sorely needed. It's a major hole in the marketplace. However, there are some scrapers who do a pretty decent job of it. The one that I like... in Scrapers are usually better than outreach tools. So outreach tools will often include sort of a haphazard contact finding portion of their tool, um, and they usually don't work really well. If you get a standalone scraper, most of them are built to scrape this sort of data. The ones that you're probably familiar with, like Scrapebox, I find to be a little counterintuitive, not very user-friendly, not a place you want to start. The one that I really like to use is called URL Profiler. You can look it up. We're not going to spend too much time going through it here. It's like a $20 a month tool. But the idea with URL Profiler is that you can gather a list of URLs. So in this case, you might just find 50 or 100 sites that you want to guest post on, right? That you know publish guest posts, they're relevant, yada, yada, yada. You copy and paste all those URLs into the tool. You run it, and it comes back with a whole bunch of data. So like... The domain authority, the page authority, it'll even look at stuff like malware status, spam status, whether or not a site is indexed in Google. So it'll check all that stuff for you. But it also scrapes emails. So it'll show you all of the emails it finds on contact pages, all of the emails it finds on about pages, and all of the emails it finds on write for us pages. In addition, it'll show you contact page URLs. So After you run all these URLs through URL Profiler, you can just kind of sort by whether or not there's an email on on the contact page or whatever. And look at all those emails, see if they seem like real ones or ones you want to use. And then if you don't, you already have the contact page URLs anyway. You don't need to do it. If you're just starting, I would say do it by hand. But what Colleen has been finding, and I think she'll tell you, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that outreach takes quite a bit of time. So I think, Colleen, you said your first go, you spent three hours and found how many? Probably less than 10. Probably less than 10. Yeah, Um, so I was very frustrated because I thought it would be easier. Yeah, and that's why this part of SEO is uh, what can make or break a site because nobody wants to spend that time. Uh, I did a round of outreach for my site, and I think I found 120 contacts in maybe eight hours or nine hours, uh, maybe even 10 hours, I don't know, over the weekend. And I was doing them by hand because they were really kind of high-end contacts I was trying to find. I think Colleen and I, when we sat down to find some together so that Colleen could see how I would actually go through and find the contacts before the call, we found that we were spending maybe 10 minutes per contact, right? Which is quite a bit. I mean, it's not super duper fast some of them are uh easier and take less time to find some of them will have an email right there on the contact page and you can just move on some of them don't and then so there's a process of making a call and maybe you're trying to record pitch ideas 
it does take time, and automating the process with a tool can save you some time. And if it's worth 20 bucks a month to you, I would say give it a whirl. URL Profiler is the one that I enjoy using and I find works the best and gathers the most data. Um, but you don't need it. That does, however, bring us to our last point, which is, oh yeah, these are free tools that you can use to find contact information. So Voila Norbert, have have we talked about these before? Maybe. Um, Voila Norbert is a good tool. So maybe we can demonstrate how this works. Works. So um, go to Google real quick, Colleen, and type in music sure. blog. Uh, and go to that one that's LA Music up at the top. LA Music blog, yeah. I'm just going to demonstrate a little bit how these free tools can kind of help you. Because they can save you some time and save you some poking around. So... Go to the about page here. I think the contact form, uh, or we don't need we don't need to look at the contact form anyway. Scroll down, and so here you can see a name of all the people that you might want to contact. I really like this one at the top, Kristen Hauser. So what we would do is go to Voila Norbert and type in lamusicblog.com and then domain, and then Kristen Hauser, and then we would just click work for me Norbert. Oh. I already reached the limit. <laughs> but if if we hadn't reached the limit, it would come back with her email. It doesn't work all the time. I ran this one before the call, so I know that we would see an awesome email here if we uh, hadn't reached our limit. But it's like $5 to use this for an hour after you reach your limit. Very cheap. And there are similar tools. There's one called Find That Lead, and these are listed in the PowerPoint. And Reportive is one that you can connect to your Gmail and guest email addresses. You can find lots of uh, stuff on that. And there are paid ones, like I said, like BuzzStream and URL Profiler, but there's a lot to be desired with most of these, including URL Profiler, even though I think it's the best. Anyway, look up these tools and see if you can use them for your own outreach. The last thing... Yeah. Can, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think one thing that I have to be careful of, just because I'm a girl on a budget is that there are really great tools that you can pay for, but sometimes it's probably worth it just to do a little extra leg work, work, especially with my tight budget. Yeah. Tell me about that story of my life, man. There's so many tools I want, but I know it's best not to. All right, so notes on efficiency. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide here. We have one more slide, if I'm not mistaken is that no email is worth an hour of research. So uh, this is one of the things that we had to correct this week. And we basically had to limit ourselves per contact. So instead of finding an email at all cost, we had to just scrap some and move on because it wasn't worth the time you're putting in. When you think about outreach, you have to think about the odds, right? So any round of outreach is going to yield between 2 and 5% conversion on links if you're doing it well and you have a good site. Different for every market, but that's a good rule of thumb. So if you want two links, you might have to send 100 emails. That's a whole lot of emails. And if you're spending 30 minutes finding one email, it adds up to just astronomical costs in human labor, right? So if you value your time at $20 an hour, you can do the math if you're spending you know, 30 minutes per email. You cannot afford that. So limit yourself per contact and understand and feel good about what you're doing because no email is worth an hour of your time. No one link probably is going to be worth an hour of your time. And spending an hour finding a link isn't a guarantee that you're going to get it. So one of the things that we're going to change as we keep doing the work is uh, limiting ourselves to a few minutes per contact. Hopefully we can get it down to like five minutes if we start rocking and rolling and find some good Google queries to use and start finding some good blogs. If we just scrap the sites that end up being too much of a hassle and moving on to the ones that are a little bit easier, we'll end up sending more emails, we'll find more contacts, and we'll get more links. So one of the big thing, things we ran into this week as we actually started to do the guest posting was efficiency. And so we wanted to just have a quick note after showing you all the stuff we were doing. Do you have anything to add to that, Colleen? Yeah, and I don't know if you had talked about this on our last call, but some of the sites that have, you know, submit your article instead of, you know, submitting your idea, I think is also big 
time crunch too, because that takes a lot of effort to write an article that right. may or may not get in. Right. You may have touched on that already though. No, that's a really good point. We have not touched on that. So some guest posts guidelines, if you've never tried to go guest post before, will ask you to submit a complete article. And that's a huge risk to me because you obviously don't want to write an 800 word article for every possible link. That's even worse than spending an hour and a half uh, or um, 30 minutes rather finding each email. There are other strategies you can use for those pages though. So one of the things that I've done in the past is to just write one super killer, awesome guest post and shop it around to a couple of those at a time. The risk there is that they might get accepted at two places at once, you know, and you'll have to tell somebody that that's what happened. But it's never happened to me. And if you only shop it around to a couple at a time or a handful at a time, um, it's usually pretty safe. So that's so you can use those pages and you don't have to write an article every single time. But for our purposes, it's exactly right. We're trying to pitch our ideas. We, we don't necessarily want to write them. We might use that strategy later. We might try to leverage those pages later. But for now... It certainly would just be a killer for our return on investment. So very good point. Cool. So what's my homework to continue getting more guest posts or do you have something else up your sleeve? Well, you've sent 20. So I think we should try to send 100 and try to get yeah. one or two links um, and or send 50 and then try to uh, write for the blogs of the friends that you'd contacted before. So we know we had five or ten people that we could potentially write blog posts for. I would say try to finish those, too. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, thanks so much, guys. We're excited. And then I think maybe after we get one or two links, it might be okay to share the site. We're scared. I don't know why. <laughs> it's probably not a big deal. But it's always scary to share a site for some reason. Yeah, I'm nervous about it. <laughs> I think it looks awesome, though. We did a lot of design stuff to get it ready to be shown i think it looks really killer um so hopefully we can show it next week maybe i think when we start getting a few links and we've got all the content up then it should be fine but for now it remains a mystery anyway thanks so much awesome work colleen thanks for tuning in let us know if you like this format in the comments and we will probably talk to you guys later bye